Well, I won't talk too much because it's probably going to be difficult to hear me. But I just, and I mean just, got out here with my tools before that hit right there. So it's been raining or misting, that old nasty mist, all yesterday afternoon, all last night. And now it looks like it's going to do it all day today. So sheathing, sheathing's off off the table it's done for now and the next few days does not look good either so we might as well move on to some electrical if the rain ever lets up i'll talk to you about that i've been reading a lot of codes this morning and i've done confuse myself <laughs> but we're going to go ahead and get started with some of the stuff that i know we can do some blocking today so we're just going to do inside work while it's raining outside let's get started now I apologize, it seems like it just does not want to stop raining today. Every time I think it's going to stop, it starts back. So you're going to have to listen to a little bit of that tin in the background. So here's my wrinkly old plans that has been through it out here with me over the last few months. And we're looking at the electrical side of things. My architect actually did a good job. We talked with him about all these different places for outlets. Those are marked there. And we have a uh, good symbol key down here as well that tells us what all of those mean. So I'll talk a little bit about what I've learned as we work through the house today. But you can see they're labeled all the way down to GFI outlets. Um, this does not label arc fault. So there's some new codes that we have to follow as well, as well as spacing requirements. There's a lot more to this than I realize. Uh, we're gonna have a tremendous amount of outlets inside of here, thanks to new codes that tell me exactly how I have to do my house. All right, it's at this point that I really appreciate having subscribers like some of y'all. I've even had some of y'all reach out through email and really try to give me tips and advice on the electrical side of things. So, I have been reading all kinds of codes this morning to the point I have wasted a lot of time, but this is what I do. I want to make sure I don't have to redo something. And we're, we've already started kind of building this house to be a somewhat ADA compliant on our own terms. Uh, so I kind of want to continue that theme. And I have noticed that the ADA has different codes for electrical block heights than the NEC does, the National Electric Code. Now with that said, the ADA falls in the National Electric Code. The Natural Electric Code is a little more forgiving than the ADA. So I would like to go ahead and build to the ADA standards. Why not? So with that said, I think I have finally settled on a number. There is so many different numbers you can go with, but I'm not going to go with the standard height numbers. 42 inches to the bottom of the plate for the walls. This will get me under the blocking. Will also leave me some sheetrock above top for the uh, sheetrockers to kind of tape a seam. I know a lot of people say, hey, you should mount this right at the edge of a sheet so they notch a sheet and don't have to cut a full gap. Well, in my mind, they're already gonna cut full gaps on outlets that are near the floor. Does it really matter if you cut a full gap on a couple more wall switches? I don't think so but to meet the ADA compliance because you could potentially be in a wheelchair down the road. We're, again, we're kind of building the house just in case that were to ever happen. You want your switches a little lower for ease of reach while sitting. Now with the outlets, you actually want those a little higher. I'm gonna do 16 inches to the bottom of the box, which is higher than most homes, but I think will look okay. I've been really looking at this. Uh, that way, if you were in a wheelchair again and bending over, you're not bending over as far. So if y'all see anything wrong here, let me know. But I think the ADA is the way to go. That's why I'm gonna pick some of the heights that I'm doing. Now, based on y'all's recommendations a while back, I bought a fancy little tool. I thought it was gonna help me put up some of the studs a while back, especially on these big balloon frame walls, but it just will not work in daylight. And this is a laser leveler here. But now that we've enclosed the house, it's a rainy day, sheathing's up. I can see this level pretty good now. So there, I was gonna make some wooden jigs out of two by fours I could carry around and draw a line. But wow, when I have this and I can shoot a line all through the house and just move it room to room and uh, just go mark right where that green laser is. So you're gonna see me using this today. Got it on a tripod. I can set it from about uh, 15 to 16 inches all the way up to well past my switch height right here. So nothing to it, but to do it, let's get started. I hope I don't have to tear these boxes back out and I get them correct. This is something I'm just doing because it's a rainy day thing to do. I'm not running wires in this anytime soon. I still have to finish sheeting. So I like doing stuff early like this. It gives y'all time to catch any mistakes that you see. and gives me time to fix them.
Alright, so since I'm using mainly 4 inch electrical boxes, I am just taking whatever I want the top height of my box to be. And uh, I'm going to make one line right here, adjust my laser to it. And it's shooting through, which y'all can't see on camera, several rooms. So I'm only going to have to move it a few times throughout the entire house, otherwise I can just leave it still. So as soon as I get that 20 inch top height, that gives me my 16 inch bottom height and falls well within the ADA guidelines for an outlet. Now there's some really tight areas where I know I want an outlet, like say right here for the refrigerator, but I can't get in here and swing a hammer. So I'm just going to use my handy dandy palm nailer. I don't see why it wouldn't work. I am uncertain if you can run an outlet right in line beside a water line. So to cover myself and not have to do a bunch more searching, I think the outlet will go good right there and still be hidden. So here is the water line for my refrigerator ice maker and just what I need right here to power up the refrigerator. All right, so now y'all can see what I'm doing. Here is that green laser level and I'm perfectly putting it across the top of the box to make sure everything is at the correct height. And this uh, laser is shooting all through the house, even into other rooms. Like I said, the camera's just not picking it up. So now I can work into the bathroom uh, almost, I may even be able to work all the way into the back, but it's no big deal to pick it up and move it because the concrete is level. Now, believe it or not, there's a lot of misconceptions about electrical that I'm finding out. For example, I had always heard no more than six outlets per breaker, per run of line. I can't find that anywhere. Even talk to the inspector, he said that is absolutely not a rule. What you're supposed to calculate is your intended load. You're not supposed to never do 80% more than the breaker load. I'm running 12 gauge everything in this house, 20 amp breakers. So I'm never supposed to exceed 80% of 20 amps. Now we're wiring something like a bedroom in a closet. I'll never get anywhere near that. So according to uh, everything I'm reading, I can put as many outlets on a run of line as I want to because it's all about amperage and intended use, not number of outlets. Thought that was kind of cool. Glad to hear that because I was thinking every six outlets had to run a new line. Something else that they have going is called the six and 12 rule. So basically, there can be no more than 12 foot in between two outlets or the six foot rule, which is the halfway point. So say if you were to put a lamp or something halfway in between two outlets, they want within six foot of either side of another outlet you to be able to plug in because apparently six foot is a standard cord length. It seems crazy that I have to build to manufacturers lamp cord lengths and things like that, but that's the code. Now that also changes dramatically based on doorways, which way the door opens. Lots of different things can move an outlet. Uh, fireplaces, things like that actually don't count in that rule. So it starts getting really confusing really fast. The easiest thing I have noticed, if when in doubt, just put an extra outlet in, even though I don't want to get too many looking too bad. But nobody's ever complained about having too many outlets. Everybody complains about having not enough outlets. So y'all know me, I tend to overthink things, but I want to make sure, I'm really big into symmetry. So we know that the bed is going on this wall right here. I want to make for sure that the bed is dead center, and then I want to know the width of my bed, which we're going to do a king size bed, and that's 76 inches wide is the standard width. So what I'm trying to accomplish there is I want outlets just either side of the bed where we're going to have nightstands to charge phones and things like that. I don't really want them behind the bed. I don't want them sticking out in the opening. You see an ugly cords there. So wherever the dead point is of the bed, split it in half, go either direction. I want an outlet as close to the edge of the bed as I could possibly get. So I'm figuring that out right now.
Now, I hope I'm making the right choice here. Y'all speak up if I'm not, but I am putting in a two gang box for my dryer plug. Um, I see they make face plates for single gang boxes, which I think is quite common. And I think I have found face plates for two gang boxes. It just seems like it'd make a whole lot more sense to put that big four conductor 30 amp 220 plug in a double gang box. I'd have a lot more room. So hopefully those face plates are easy to get. All right, so I am seeing all kinds of crazy different heights for outlets over your cabinets. Now keep in mind, we're gonna have a bar top over here, then it goes into your standard height kitchen cabinets on the way around. So I figure I'm gonna run all my outlets on this side of this six by six right here, and then we're gonna have switches just over there because this is technically the countertop height. Now I know we're probably gonna go with standard countertop heights, which are 36 inches, it's the most common. Then you typically do a three or four inch backsplash, so now we're at 40 inches, and I see a lot of people recommend you can run outlets close to that. I I'm gonna go a little higher, give myself some wiggle room, and do 42 inches to the bottom of the box. I don't wanna to get too high toward the other cabinets, but I wanna give myself enough wiggle room that if we do a slightly larger backsplash, if the countertop's a little th uh, thicker, I think two extra inches is plenty good right there. But if y'all see anything wrong with this, let me know. This is the last box that I have. It's taken a lot more to get the house done than I realized. I only have to go buy a few more single gang boxes um, to finish this, so I've got plenty of time to tear these out and move them if y'all say so. The other reason I'm sticking with 42 inches, which would be right there, I don't have much room left before I run into blocking. So the blocking was absolutely needed for me to hit the on edge nail pattern outside, but it's kind of in my way out here. Uh, so I really can only go up about an additional inch to 43 to the bottom of the box. So you electricians, let me know. So my plan is because I know kitchen outlets, uh, especially countertop outlets, can get used by some pretty power intensive appliances, Instapot, crock pots, things like that. I'm going to run a separate circuit to every other outlet that I put in. That way we have two separate outlets or circuits going just to the countertop outlets and then I'll put an additional in uh, for the dishwasher and things like microwave that are very power hungry and kind of need their own dedicated outlet. But I wanted to make sure that I had at least two 20 amp, 12 gauge uh, circuits running up here to these countertop outlets. There's nothing more aggravating than trying to plug in two appliances, cook, maybe entertain you, have people bring over their own crock pots and you keep tripping a breaker. So we're gonna make for sure we have plenty of power up here on the countertop side. Now I thought about putting double boxes in and running two wires, separate circuits in each box with two separate outlets but this blocking's kind of in the way. All my two gang boxes I've been finding have nails that have to be driven down in a 45 degree angle up top and there's just no room to do that. But these single gang boxes fit in just fine underneath the blocking. So every other stud, I'll probably just put a different box in for a different circuit. All right, so this is the inside of the bathroom and I've been really struggling with what I wanna do here. I had a two gang box, I took it out, decided I was gonna do a three gang box. I think I'm gonna do a four gang box. I'll tell you why. Y'all let me know if my thinking is correct here. So I'm going to need one switch to turn on a main light in the bathroom, a second switch to turn on a vanity light. The vanity is right here. So this is very convenient to everything. I'll need a third switch for the exhaust fan. It might as well be right here where the wiring is really easy to get to. And I've got a fourth location in this box. I really need to put a GFI outlet. So if you're going to want to plug in a hair dryer or something like that in here, although Tiffany has her own half bath or get ready room, you never know if you're going to have company that may need to get ready in here. So I could just put it all in one box. I do believe, I don't see why not. I see they make wall plates for three switches and one GFI. So this seems like the perfect thing to do. My only big concern with this is that's a lot going on in one box. So I see this has a tab. I'm going to put a piece of blocking in over here and come out and actually screw this to it so this doesn't ever want to push in or break from behind the sheetrock on me. Boy, that laser is nice. It's set up in another room and still shooting all the way into here. I think it was Kevin Brewer that recommended I get one of these. Thanks, Kevin.
<clears throat> All right, now this is the kind of stuff that drives me crazy. <laughs> so I just put a three gang box in here. This is Tiffany's half bath slash get ready room. We're gonna build her uh, basically a powder room right in here. Um, a big vanity here that she can slide a chair up underneath mirrors so she can get ready. So we needed a three gang box, one to turn on uh, an overhead light and vent fan, two to turn on very bright lights right here for her to get ready. And three, I wanna put a GFI outlet in right here so she can plug in hair dryer or curling iron. Her vanity stops about right here so she can plug it in and actually just lay it right here. Now, because this box is gonna be seeing a lot of play with a plug, this drives me crazy. So every time you go to push your plug in, you're depending on that tiny little plastic lip basically the outlet cover right here to keep this from pushing back in to the sheetrock. That's not gonna work for me because you know as you unplug and plug in many times, eventually you're gonna crack the box, you're gonna bust the uh, cover on the outside, it's not gonna work. So I think if I were to shim right in behind here and put a small brad nail or two in, it'll be perfect, it'll, it'll work great. These three gang boxes I've noticed don't have tabs to block out like the four gang boxes do. I decided to go ahead and screw it because it dawned on me. Not only are you gonna be pushing into this, you're gonna be pulling out too. And the shim would only help with pushing, but the screws, now that really helps. It's actually twisting this a little. That's gonna make a heck of a difference. It keep me from breaking stuff down the road. It's little things like that that I like to think about. So now it is next day and the house looks completely different with all these blue boxes everywhere. So I literally spent hours yesterday reading codes on the ADA, the NEC, everything. Tiffany and I come out here and spend a lot of time late yesterday afternoon while it was pouring rain talking about where we want locations of things because I have run completely out of electrical boxes. A while back we were having electrical box crunch and I still hear that we are having it due to some resin shortages. And I just piled a bunch of them in the buggy. I didn't count, didn't have plans with me, nothing. I wanna make sure I got something. So I've got quite a bit of boxes done throughout the house, picked our heights, and we've did a lot of discussion about where we want things to go. So like I said, I've got to go pick up a ton more boxes because we haven't even made it up to, we hadn't even finished all the outlets. I think all the switches are done, and we haven't made it to uh, roof boxes either. Fans, lights, tons of lights. Oh my goodness, at the lights we got to do. Plus, we have already changed our mind from the plans. We are not going to follow what was in our electrical plan for all the fans and all. We have discovered these new, like, eight-foot-wide fans. We've had some friends get them. The prices have dropped a lot, and we love them. We think they look awesome. We're thinking one huge eight foot fan in here. It's the ones that go really slow, but put off a ton of air. We want to do one in here and a big outdoor one outside. That way we're not putting in six stinking fans and running wire everywhere and hanging boxes everywhere. These one huge fans work extremely well. We have a friend that's got one in a much bigger pole barn than this, and it does, does a really good job. It'll easily cover this living room. So we'll talk about all that coming up. Um, one thing I wanna jump on, as y'all can see this morning, it's a little sunny for the first time in days. I haven't seen the sun. I was having an issue yesterday with rain actually, believe it or not, blowing in the house through here. I had to cut the fan off because it's been such a fine mist uh, the last day and a half. 
and it started wetting the OSB too. So uh, I spoke with the inspector, he approved my nail pattern. I asked him, could I go ahead and start taping the seams at least in case we get some more of this blowing rain. I already hear thunder in the distance. Um, he okayed it, he was fine with the nail pattern. So I think to wrap this video up, we're gonna go ahead and start taping some seams on this one big wall right here and we could go around the corner as well. So I brought a few rolls of that uh, zip tape out and we'll do that in just a second. I'll explain why I'm doing that because it is not required. Uh, real quick for those of y'all that don't know what flashing tape is. So this is Zip. Um, this company right here makes a lot of that board that we've talked about that already has a outside weather barrier on it. I could not find or find that stuff. It's got a really good reputation, but so does their tape. So I made for sure that I got some of their tape right here. So what this is, is a basically a rubber butyl backed tape, a flashing tape. And this tape is good for sealing seams as well as flashing for wrapping around windows, doorways, things like that. So you're gonna see me use it a lot. I bought a big case of it and probably gonna get another case before this project's over with. So typically what you do is you know your OSB up like this, you're done. Now you can put your house wrap on there and you, your, your house wrap is your vapor barrier. That's what keeps water from getting through to the wall, but it's a breathable house wrap. It's weird that it can allow air to pass through, but it does not allow water. That way, if water was to ever get behind your siding, it hits the wrap and it goes straight to the ground. That's what it's designed for. Now there's something very important that you should do to your house, and it's uh, an air barrier. You know, we're putting up the vapor barrier, but we need to do an air barrier. Some people will actually come back and caulk these joints. I hear a lot of people say they don't do nothing. They're depending on this OSB nailed to that thin stud in there to seal up air. Well, that's just not gonna happen. You're gonna have air gaps everywhere. So by coming back and taping these seams, I am creating an air barrier for the house first. That uh, tape bonds really well, covers the nail holes, which is awesome, uh, seals up the gaps and joints, and doesn't allow air in or out. Because don't forget, at the end of this house build, we have to pass what's called a blower door test. Basically, they seal up a door, uh, blow a fan in there, pressurize the house, and take a reading. And if you have too many leaks and gaps, you do not pass. You, you've got a leaky house that is just not well designed. So sealing up these seams is really going to help with the air barrier. Now also sealing up these seams right now, because it may be a little while before I get house wrap on, all this blowing rain and everything else, we know from testing that the edge is the most sensitive part of OSB, although it performed better than I realized. This outside pressed board right here, um, it doesn't really seem to absorb water or flake off much, but these edges are what's delicate. So if I can go ahead and get those wrapped and we just get a crazy afternoon thunderstorm that blows rain in here, at least that rain is not coming down, working its way into those gaps and settling on the edges. Um, so that's why I asked for permission to go ahead and tape it up. It'll just make me feel better. It's just one more step toward a weather barrier, even though it's ultimately for an air barrier. So let's go ahead and start taping these. Here's the way I'm going to do it. I think the best way to do it is go ahead and tape all my horizontal seams first, and then I'll come back and tape my vertical seams. Uh, that way I can shingle over. So if I already have a horizontal seam right here, and then I come down and shingle over, although I don't expect any water to ever get past my vapor barrier, um, it could. So I, if water were to get on this tape and run down, I don't want that tape behind another tape. You want to shingle over the top so it can run over and continue its way down toward the ground. So uh, that's probably a little over and above what I need to be doing, but it's what I do. Overdue is what I do. Might need to put that on a shirt even though it sounds stupid. Yeah, I overdo.
Now the other important thing that I forgot to mention about this tape that I strongly prefer over caulk is these joints. It even says right here, and you've heard me talk about it, we have to space these joints out an eighth of an inch for expansion and contraction of the wood. That's going to happen the rest of its life. As it gets hot, as it gets cold, wood is going to expand and contract. This tape will move with it. It will not break. Caulk, once you put it in there, once this expands, it tears, it creates a gap. Once it contracts, it pushes some of it out. Once that happens many, many times, the caulk is no longer bonded or sealed. Now you're back to air gaps, holes for ants to get in, everything else. The tape is without a doubt the way to go. I guess it's time to wrap this video up so I can go to the hardware store, pick up a bunch more electrical boxes, and start the next video for y'all. So, oh, it has turned off so stinking hot today. But I'm starting to see a bunch of clouds in the sky. I think we got rain on the way. At least that'll cool it off. All right, so my lines look like a drunk person did it, but uh, that's okay. All nail holes are covered on the seams, and all seams are covered. I really like seeing this. That lets me know I have a very good and very well sealed house now i'm probably going to come back and go ahead and seal around the windows for an air gap but technically you pull your house wrap in and flash after the fact which i still will do but i may put flashing tape in before i just really want to think this through that shouldn't cause any kind of problem now that i think about it um i just want to make sure that these all these gaps right here where the uh, osb meets the studs doesn't become an air gap that can blow out behind the house wrap later so I'll probably go ahead and seal those too. I'll just uh, wait for another rainy day to kind of jump into that. But for the most part, everything's ready to go. I did not tear the plastic off the end. I can seal that up oh, once I tear it off and start on the back. No big deal there. It's protected from the rain. But now everything is nice and good. Nails are protected, seams are sealed, and we're one step closer. I know some people are gonna argue, hey, you're sealing your house up too well. I think that's an old wives tale personally. You're starting to see a lot more reputable builders getting away from the a leaky house is a good thing because a house needs to breathe. That's that's not my philosophy. If I if I were to hire a builder right now and see gaps and leaks everywhere and they tell me, oh, your house needs to breathe, that's okay. I would have to find a new build, builder. That means somebody is not taking the time to seal that house up properly. I want to control what air goes in my house. There is things you can do, um, like a fresh air intake on your AC system for a house that's sealed up really well. Yes, you want an influx of fresh air. I totally get that. But what I don't want an influx of is roaches coming in, ants, all kinds of bugs, and my hard-earned money, money literally getting blown out of the house, out of a leaky house via my AC system. What's the point of that? I want this house so stinking sealed tight that I have to put a fresh air intake. That way it's coming in one location, I determine what comes in my house. So uh, I just know that's gonna be addressed by people, but I just personally don't believe in a leaky house is a good house. I think that's a bad thing. And I'm gonna go above and beyond to uh, make sure that I seal this house up good. So that's that. I just know I'm gonna get asked. I'll tell you what's another good thing that I did this. I found like four locations that I missed nails. Um, you know, getting hot, running down to the fan, taking a break, taking a lunch break, taking a water break, answering a phone call, you wind up forgetting, hey, I forgot to nail this section. I found several today. That's a beautiful thing about putting the tape up too. If I had to tape this and just threw house wrap up on it, there were several sections that were not nailed that I would have completely missed and would have never even known about until they're blowing around, creaking, flopping, something like that. So, yeesh, 
things happen. Even as picky as I am, I missed several sections, but we caught them today because I was taping. You're looking right at, dang, there's no nails here. Or when you're rolling over it, you're seeing a, a board buckle. Yeah, so I'm really glad I caught those today, and I'll continue to do that as I work around the house. All right, I got to get with it. I'll catch you on the next video. Thanks for watching.